follow along. Great. And if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, turn to Matthew 19 is where we're going to start this morning. Matthew 19. We mentioned last time, and I'm going to open this in prayer in just a minute, that when you get into chapter 2, there is an attack that comes from those who do not believe in biblical authority that this is a second version of creation. So what we have in chapter 2, actually beginning in verse number 5. So these chapter divisions are, are very artificial. Okay, What I mean by that is um, chapter divisions were not part of original inspiration. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're really not helpful at all. And this is one of those areas where it's not really helpful because um, the first chapter really doesn't finish until chapter 2, verse 4, and then you have this break in chapter 5. And what hap what's happening in chapter 2, I just want to bring this to our attention before we ask the Lord's help. Um, no, let's not do it that way. Let's ask the Lord's help first. Um, Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your word uh, we praise you that you have communicated to us um, things that we would have had no understanding of at all um, had you not spoken a word to us, a perfect word. And so we ask for this class to fortify, strengthen our confidence in the perfect word of God. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would um, help us know how to answer those who attack it, those who question its um, its reliability, its infallibility, its inerrancy. Uh, Lord, we want to um, just humbly allow the Word of God to be over us and not for us to be over the Word. And so I pray that you'd help me as I instruct, as I guide, that we would be able to have questions answered and be built up in our faith. And we pray these things for the glory of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So, um, Back to where I was at um, before I forgot to pray or was going to delay praying. Um, Genesis 2 is often attacked as a second account of creation. Um, but what we actually have in Genesis 2 is something that's very familiar in Hebrew literature, which is to give basically a, a headline and then give the details. In fact, I think a headline might be a good illustration so you may see a series of headlines on your um, whatever your browser's on. So if you're Yahoo or you're Google, you may see some news headlines, but then you see those headlines getting more specifics. So you, you click on the article, you kind of see the broad you know, announcement, and then it zooms in. So what happens in Genesis 2 is it zooms in on one particular day of creation. What day is that? Day number six, okay? So it zooms in, mentions day number seven, which I believe is the conclusion of chapter one, really not a new chapter, a new thought. And then it zeroes in on chapter, or on the sixth day of creation, and not the beast of the field, but specifically who? The creation of man, all right? So if I were to go back to chapter one, verses 26 and 27, here's the headline, drum roll. The headline, the headline is, God created humans in his image, imagio Dei, and he made them male and female. That happens on day six. When I get to chapter two and verse five, throughout the chapter, he zeroes in back on day number six to give us the specifics. God in his providence and kindness knew that we needed more information. Some people ask, well, why did, why did God zero back in and circle around, give us more specifics about the creation of humans because he believed we needed more information. And I hope every married couple here is very thankful that God gave us more information instead of just saying he created them male and female. I mean, because at the end of Genesis 2, he's going to give us the design for the first institution, and that is a marriage. Um, he's going to speak to gender, and that's important in our culture today. Um, he's going to speak of sexual orientation, and that's very helpful for us today. So I hope instead of saying, oh, this must be a second creation account, we will see the very wise providence of God in giving us more detail. 
Um, so he zeroes in it, and what happens in chapter 2, verse 5, is he starts a history that doesn't end until Revelation. Um, this history that starts in Genesis 2 is the history of humanity. Now, let's remember, the star of the scriptures is not man, okay? So let's not go there. But what he is giving us is an account from origins to consummation. It includes the fall. It includes all the history of God redeeming his people and making them a new man in Christ. And then the consummation of the age as we read it in the book of Revelation, okay? So we, end, we start with a garden. We end with a city. But what we start with in the garden, we actually end with some of the specifics back in the city. Is anybody just trivia? You know of some of the specifics that start in Genesis and recur in Revelation 20, 21, 22. What are some of those things that show up again? The what? New earth. Okay, so we have a new earth, the old earth that was perfect. Everything God created, he said what? Is good. After the fall, it's been under a curse. It had a global flood. It's been under that curse, and sin-cursed humans have been tending to it and destroying it and committing sin on it. So we need a new heaven, a new heaven, and a new earth. That's going to happen, so that recurs. So we have a perfect earth that God created, and then in the consummation, we have a new one. What are some of the specifics of the garden that show up again? I wish I had the music to Jeopardy. What's that? Light. We're told there's no need for light in the new heaven and new earth because God is the light. The Lamb is the light, which might answer that one little uh, trivia thing, that uh, riddle that we threw out there that's attacked by those that do not believe the word of God. Why was there no light until the third day? What did they, I mean, fourth day, what did they, third day. What did they do for light? Um, what else shows up? God is with man. Wonderful theme. Throughout the Bible, God has tented with man. He's dwelling with man. There is perfect fellowship and harmony. God is dwelling with his people. We're told just in that passing comment that God was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It's just a passing comment. But think about it. Before sin, the kind of interaction, face-to-face -face interaction we're having right now is the kind of interaction humans were created for with God. We were not created for this distance that we're re presently experiencing right now. Do you realize that? So if your heart longs to see God, it's a right longing. This is, this is not the way we were created. We were not created for the great silence. Do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the great silence? Let's just be real honest right now. We have God's word and we praise God for it, amen? Amen but we're not hearing God speak to us today. We're not having face-to-face -face interaction with God. You say, well, I pray to God. Praise God for prayer. Praise God that we can boldly approach the throne because we're in Christ. But we don't have the face-to-face -face intimacy of relationship that our hearts long for, but we were created for it. Jack just brought up a huge mega theme of the scriptures. You want to talk about meta-narrative, big story of the Bible? God dwelling with his people is that. He started dwelling with his people in perfect fellowship, and then they're removed from the garden. And what's guarding the garden after that? We're, we're speeding ahead, but I want to park on this for a second. This is so helpful. What guards the garden where they can't re-enter? The cherubim, right? Then we see the cherubim again show up, embroidered on something. What were they embroidered on? The Ark of the Covenant, they were on the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat, but they were also embroidered on the, the, the curtain, right? They were guarding the Holy of Holies, right? Then we see Isaiah. He refers to these, these winged animals or, or beings. I shouldn't say animals. These winged beings. They have the six wings, right? And then we come to the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and they are singing their normal chorus, holy, holy, holy. 
And now, every tribe, every tongue and nation in the Lamb are around the throne. And now God is pleased, we're told in Revelation 19 and 20, to dwell with his people again. So, yes, that's a similarity. So, right now, we're in the great silence. Now, we have the Word of God, praise God. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us, praise God. We have the church. We get to preach the Word, sing the Word, pray the Word, all those things we're going to do today. But let's be honest, this is not what our heart longs for. 1 Corinthians 13 says, we look through a glass darkly. It's opaque right now. Does anybody feel this this week? I just want to see you, God. I'm tired of looking through a glass darkly. Does anybody here ever long to see God? You're going to. You're going to see God. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a whole sermon right there. I feel like preaching that. I won't, but... What else? There's some specifics, little details that show up again too. Do you know where I'm going with this? The tree of life. The tree of life comes back. And what were the cherubim keeping Adam and Eve from returning into the garden and doing? Eating from the... Now that's just a little inquisitive there. I don't know that I have all the answers. But I do believe the reason why is if had they eaten of the tree of life in the sinful state... They would have been in that state forever. That's my best guess. And it was God's mercy that kept them from eating the tree of life. Now, you might have a different version or guess. I'm not going to die on that hill, but that's my guess. There's also the river of life. We have these rivers in the garden that are flowing. I want you to view Eden, and we're going to read about that in Genesis 2, but I want you to view Eden as the first tabernacle of sorts. Adam was serving somewhat as a high priest in the garden, And I'm not giving it all of the details of the later on priesthood, but he was, Eden speaks of, and it talks about these rivers that are flowing, Mount Eden, and later on it's referred to that. So so you should vision Eden that has been destroyed now, particularly after the flood, as this, this location where that's what a mountain does. A mountain basically connects earth with heaven, and that was the view of the temple and the tabernacle. And, and Adam served as that until he sinned against God. With that in mind, if it's true that Genesis 2 is a separate creation account, what would we expect Jesus to say when he refers to both, the Genesis 1 account and the Genesis 2 account? I want to say this. Theistic evolutionists right now, the primary place they're going is Genesis 1 and 2, and they're going to Genesis 2 saying... Genesis 1 is poetry. Genesis 1 has rhyme and meter. Genesis 1, hidden in the Hebrew, is just like Miriam's song. It's just like um, the song of Deborah in Judges. And so this should not be viewed literally. You go to Genesis 2, when he starts talking about, you know, out of the ground, now we have just some nice language of evolution. So God really, in more of a deist fashion, he started everything and he got it going, and then he pulled back. Now, what would we expect if Jesus was referring to both Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 to say? He would not speak of them as the same event, right? So that's why I invited you to Matthew 19. Jesus is going to refer to both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 as the what? The beginning. I want you to see this in the text. Verse 3 says, And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him, asking him, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any case? Cause. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put a, be, may, man separate. Just real quickly. Which part is quotation from chapter 1 of Genesis and which part is a quotation from Genesis 2? Just shout it out. We're all family and friends here. Okay, male and female comes from where? Genesis 1, 26, 27. He made them male and female in the image of God. Where is Genesis 2 quoted? The same passage. Do you see it? Leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. So here we have the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to speak as a fool for a moment. 
You may think I do that often, but I'm going to speak as a fool. We have the Lord Jesus mistaken that Genesis 1 was history and Genesis 2 was both history as well. Or he sees them as one account that zoomed in on the sixth day. Which is the answer? The answer is, it's the sixth day zoomed in, okay? So from Genesis 2, some would argue all the way to Genesis 50. He's going to mention this in Genesis chapter 5, that this is the generation or the histories, the genesis of humans. So now he's going to track human history all the way through your Bible. And that's what he's saying in Genesis 2. He's saying, okay, I gave you all the days of creation. It was all good, but now I'm going to zoom in on humanity. Is everybody with me? Okay, turn back, please, to Genesis chapter 2. Last week, we, we talked about the Sabbath day, or no, I shouldn't say that. We talked about Saturday. We talked about the seventh day, because it's not the Sabbath yet. We should not read back Sabbath day here. He is using Saturday to reflect upon the completion of his creation. And I mentioned to you last week, we should, on Saturdays, have somewhat of a memorial day of a celebration day about God's perfect creation. Did you do any of that yesterday? Did you think about that yesterday? I did while I was doing a little yard work, running outside. I was thinking, God, thank you for this day and this beauty. Your creation is perfect. He set it aside. He blessed it. He rested, not because he was tired, but he was reflecting upon the completion of his creation. And he also set it aside and blessed it. So it is a separate day to be reflected upon his perfect creation. Then we talk in verse number four, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to put to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and, a, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Now, just real quickly, he's then going to talk about forming man. Again, this is a place of attack for those who want to question the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture. What they'll say here is, hey, see there, he's, he's gone back and said that there were no vegetations that came up on day three. Day three, not day four. Day four was the lights, the sun and moon. But what happened on day three? Remember our motions? We have water, land, and what? Plants, okay? All right? So they will attack this saying, wait, He's saying before he created man, there were no plants. That's contradicting day number three because he's already told us that vegetation came on what day? Day number what? Okay, well, as always, if we look a little closer and compare Scripture with Scripture, and this may require pulling out a concordance and seeing what the Hebrew word is, but you'll notice that when you go to chapter 3, and we're told that the ground has been cursed because of Adam's sin. He's going to have to start doing something that he never did in the garden. Which is plowing and planting and fertilizing and watering and weeding. <laughs> now, some of you may have thought that that was all along what we were supposed to do. But there is no hint that humans had to plow had to plant, had to, to weed, or do any of those things that farmers were grateful for do today. They had all the vegetation, all the food that was necessary for them to thrive without tilling the ground. Now, that is important because the words that are used here in Hebrew in Genesis 3 to talk about the kind of difficulty he's going to have, he's going to have to, from sweat, get his bread one of the words here, he says, there was no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain in the land, and there was no man to work the ground. What he's referring to here are weeds. He's referring to um, things that will make it difficult for harvesting, for planting, for bringing forth crops. Some of you know what this is like in your flower gardens. You're out there weeding. And that's more for cosmetics and aesthetics than it is for hurting your flowers generally. But we know what it's like. If you don't weed something, it will overtake them. That's because there had been no what up to this point? No rain. Now remember, no rain. First rain comes when? About a thousand years later at the flood. 
Now, this is hard for us to imagine, but he says there was a different irrigation system before the fall. And even after the fall, this irrigation system was water came up from the deep. So we're to understand this, that the hydrological system, now I'm no scientist, as you know, but in my reading of scientists who are creationists who begin to describe what was like pre-flood, when you imagine the entire expanse, that water shield that we're told about on the second day of creation, all of that's removed. Now, there is not the natural, and we're told that during the flood, what happens? The great deeps open up. So this passage seems to be saying that there was a natural irrigation system that the garden enjoyed and that the whole earth enjoyed that didn't require any rain. When rain first shows up, is it blessing or judgment? It's judgment, right? Now, rain's not always judgment, but we find post-fall that God talks about using rain as a blessing or as a what? A judgment. So droughts come. Um, all of these things happen. Rain comes as a blessing. Droughts come as a punishment. And somehow, with after the post-flood, the the hydrological system that we now experience with wind and with storms and with the way um, water evaporates and then comes down in rain and storms like that, that is not anything they'd experienced. So they didn't have any weeds because some of this vegetation is the result of rain. The other thing that he uses a word here is for harvest, for barley, for that kind of thing, for wheat. And he says, you're going to have to, by the sweat of your brow, make bread, okay, or grow bread, grow, you know, grain for bread. So prior to the fall, there was no what? Plowing and harvesting, um, no planting. So this was something that was a post-fall vegetation. So again, the scriptures, by comparing one passage to another, he, he's not contradicting what happened on day three. He's saying, I'm going to give you the generation of humans now. And before the fall, there were certain plants that were not available because there was no rain. He says that, no rain. And he says there were certain things that weren't available because man wasn't tilling the ground. <laughs> okay, so he wasn't tilling the ground until what? Post-fall. See what I'm saying? I only bring this to your attention because I noticed this passage in my reading is attacked by Christians. And... They're not reading this from the text. They're reading it into the text by saying, okay, this is a different account, and basically what we have here is a contradiction. This must mean that there was some type of theistic evolution that took place, and it's not reading the text and doing what we call exegesis. It's what's eisegesis. Eisegesis simply means this, and we all have to be careful that we don't do it. It's reading something back into the text that I want to be there. <laughs> okay? All of us know how easy that is, right? I, I've got this thought pattern, and I've just got to find a way to get it into the Bible. <laughs> That's not a good way of interpreting the Bible, right? So this is not speaking of evolution, and then he goes on to describe the, the forming of man. So we've got in verse 6, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The Lord God planted a garden in the east. So he's going to start with creation. Then he's going to talk about location. Um, then he's going to talk about the probation with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then he's going to talk about his relation with, with Eve. But, but what I want to point out here is you'll notice when he's describing this um, creation of man, let's just remind ourselves, in, on day six, what are we told in chapter one? What was different about all the other creation that God had made? I'm sorry, what's that? By him speaking, so we got ex nihilo, um, out of nothing. Now he's doing what? He's, he's forming, right? He's forming. Now we are told that even in chapter 2, the beasts are coming up what? Out of the earth. Uh, we're told that the, let the waters produce. I, I can't even imagine what that was like. I don't know if you guys ever let your imagination just kind of go, what was that like? So just imagine, um, Ryan and I, by, by the way, I want to give this unapologetic advertisement. Tomorrow, 
we're going to drop our first episode of the Scripture in Plain Reason. So if you listen to podcasts, I hope you'll go to your favorite podcast platform, sign up, listen to our first episode, subscribe, where we get some subscribers besides our wives. Um, and I think my mom may try too. So we'd like to have somebody beyond our family. But, but we're going to be talking about this. We interviewed the other night um, a scientist, a friend of mine who is a creationist. And he was just describing what was it like in one of his books, I think. I don't think he, he talked about this in the interview. But he was talking about what was it like when those dinosaurs, those, these great beasts, just came up out of the earth. When he said, let the earth be filled with all these creatures. And, and they're just coming right up, okay, just by command. The same thing happening in the waters. He says, let the waters produce all of this sea life. And, and it just produced. But man's different. So he gets his hands dirty, as it were. He forms man out of the dust of the ground. But something even beyond that, we're told in Genesis 1, what is unique about the creation of man? In God's image, okay? So, so, so fast forward, and I'll come back to those three at the top. Fast forward to the Imagio Dei. What, what is different about the creation of humans from wildlife, from the animal kingdom? Because we are told here that they became souls, or spirits, that they, that, so there was something about the animal life, that they were living beings, they got their life from the Creator. The psalmist regularly repeats this, right? That all their life is sustained by the Creator. So there's a similarity there between the animal kingdom and human life. But nowhere are we told that, hum, that, that the animal kingdom is created in the what? The image of God. What does that include? I want to give you a few that are often mentioned. First of all, being created in the image of God, humans have self-consciousness. So if you're taking notes, sorry I don't have the overhead today. I'll try to have that back by next week. But self-consciousness. My dog, Brady, has consciousness. He does not have self-consciousness. He never thinks about how his hair looks. Okay, He really doesn't. You say, how do you know? I just know, <laughs> okay? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't reflect, at least it doesn't appear that he reflects about how one day was better than the next. Um, so we have the ability, as made in the image of God, to think about thinking, to think about memories, to, to reflect upon events in our lives. The animals don't do that. Now, there are instincts. Some of you are saying, I want to argue that point. You don't know my cat. I'm glad I don't know your cat. But, but, but they don't have self-consciousness, the ability to self-reflect. Personality. That's another characteristic of being made in the image of God. And what I mean by this is not just outgoing or introvert, extrovert versus introvert. The whole ability to relate to other humans um, and to have friendships and relationships. And that, we're going to mention that in a minute. But, but having characteristics of personality, not just instincts, this is what this kind of creature does, but to have your own distinct characteristics about how you interact, interact with other people, other humans. Um, and those go with characteristics. So God's attributes is what we call them. We, we talk about the attributes of God. We, we don't generally talk about our animals that way. And we may say he's friendly, good with kids. Um, but that's different than saying, you know what, um, really, really um, intriguing, engaging, um, you know, real sensitive to the needs of other people, um, uh, kind of quiet, withdrawn. I mean, we, we don't typically express that about our pets. Not only personality, self-consciousness, personality, um, but um, the... Uh, what was I going to say here? I should have filled in my own blanks. Self-consciousness, personality. Oh, intellect. Thank you. Intellect or intelligence is the third category. Um, now, again, we're not saying that animals can't be taught tricks. All right? But with humans, there is the ability to take information, to think about information, and then make decisions based on that information. So the goal of all knowledge is for it to translate into wisdom, skillful living. And that is one of the characteristics of being made in the image of God. Creativity. Um, you could go to the Philadelphia Zoo and you're not going to see those animals that are caged there doing 
much creativity, okay? There's not much creative inventions that are taking place at our zoos. Um, I haven't heard of one all my life, of 48 years, that something was invented in a zoo or by a chimpanzee. Um, this creative ability to take something and make it better or to make something original and to make an invention, this is something that is characteristic of being made in the image of who? Of God. I mean, if you go to Europe or you go to some of these places and you look at these amazing pieces of art, right? Or you, you see some of these sculptures and you just think, or you, or you just contemplate, how in the world did they build those pyramids? I mean, they must have known something engineering-wise that we just don't, we forgot, <laughs> or our brains shrunk. It's just amazing to consider, right? Um, this is a image of God fingerprint. And then finally, the ability to have, I've already mentioned this, relationships. Being made in the Imagio Dei places humans in a distinct category from all the other creatures. Now, I want to back up now, and I want to just give you, I'm going to try to give you these, instead of having one lecture on comparing evolution with creationism, I'm just going to take a few of them at a time. So this one is kind of like a, we're going to take a, um, um, an advertisement, maybe not an advertisement, we're going to just take a little break here and, and go to some ways that we could have a discussion with someone who believes in uh, biological evolution and say, um, this this doesn't make logical sense, okay? So we've looked at the scriptures, and unfortunately there are a lot of Christians today that want to come to the scriptures and say there's no possibility they can be true because of all the scientific discoveries. But let's just look at a few. Remember I told you that one of the principles for evolutionary thought is this big word called what? Uniformitarianism. Can somebody give us another definition? I think Jack gave us the, the, the most memorable definition. So Jack, I'm going to lean on you again. You can use the accent too. Have you forgotten what you said? The way it is is the way it always was. Right, yeah. I think you had a little, a little southern slang to it. It was, it was really memorable. Um, basically, here's uniformitarianism. The key to the past is the present. All right? The way it is is the way it always was. All right? So uniformitarianism basically is saying that this gradualism uh, or uniformitarianism that everything that we see now, you can just back it up. You can just rewind it. That's how they get an old earth. That's billions of years. That's their magic carpet. They keep. So one of the ways to discuss intelligently with someone who is an evolutionist or has bought into evolutionary theory is to do what was called an argument from ad absurdum. So basically, you're taking their argument, and you're saying, okay, let's just use your argument. Let's assume it's true for a moment, and just rewind it. Because there have been scientific discoveries that if we were to use uniformitarianism or gradualism as a law, physical law, it turns out to be absurd. I want to give you three. There's a lot more of them, but here's one. The rate of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, uniformitarianism is saying that the magnetic field has always basically been the same. Now, they agree that we're seeing changes in it. So uniformitarianism isn't saying that the magnetic field hasn't changed. They're all observing the same data. And the same data says that there's exponential decay going on even with the Earth's magnetic fields. So that means if you flattened it out and you kind of run it back in time and you look at its current half-life, it's almost like looking at your battery power, Here's what happens. It would be about 20 times stronger just 6,000 years ago, which is for young earthers or those that believe that this is a literal account in Genesis 1 and 2, that would place us about 6,000 years ago and the magnetic fields would be about 20 times stronger than they are now, which would have been actually very nice. It, it, in most accounts, it would have been more optimal. It would have protected from cosmic rays and mutations and cancer that we see a lot more of today. Um, so probably 6,000 years ago, when Adam and Eve were created, that the magnetic field being stronger, so you just back it up. Let's just do what they say, and let's, let's have this, this um, uniformitarianism argument. He here's the thing. If you were to back it up 60,000 years, not to mention the millions of years 
that they're wanting to do, if you were to just back it up 60,000 years, just keep the same track that it would have, the magnetic field would begin to rip apart humans and the atoms of our body would be pulled apart um, and it would be stronger than a neutron star is what I've read this week. So, so just taking the argument and saying, okay, I can do that. Let's just use your argument and use uniformitarianism and just back up what every scientist, both creationists and evolutionists, are saying today about the magnetic field. And let's just rewind it as you say that it's been. We get to 60,000 years, and you're saying that the planet is at probably 14.3 billion years old. And if that's the case the magnetic field would have ripped apart every original human being and there would have been no ability for there to be a survival of the fittest or natural selection. To me, that's just one of those kind of neat little discussions, hopefully not an argument, that you could have with a uniformitarianist. Here's a second one, carbon dating. And again, this is not romantic, as you know. Um, we're talking about C14 typically, and again, I'm no scientist, so I've only learned this from my reading but I guess C14, no surprise here, is two extra neutrons from C12. But there, what happens with C14 is there's spontaneous decay, and C14 or carbon-14 turns into nitrogen, is my understanding, over time. And then it will fossilize. or, or um, so, so again, let's just rewind it. And that's what scientists have, have been able to do. So we take this principle, all things have been the same, we get the half-life again. We would go back, let's just go back 5,700 years, and we would expect that when you dig up fossils, or you break open coal, um, or you open up a diamond, you're going to find C14 in there if it's just 5,700 years to 6,500 years like we would suggest. You would also find C14 perhaps in fossils of, or even some, some soft uh, molecules and dinosaur fossils. That's what you would expect if the world was only 5,700 to 6,500 years. Guess what we're finding? In every piece of coal, in every diamond that's discovered, we're finding C14, which tells us that if you just rewind it back forward or, or backwards, this carbon dating, there would not be any possibility for C14 to have survived billions of years. Now again, this is simply taking their argument, saying, okay, let's just use your argument for the sake of argument, and what happens is it's absurd. There's no possibility that you can have uniformitarianism go for billions of years and C14 still be in every piece of coal that we break open. i got to tell you this story. Also in the interview that we had the other night, we did talk about this. Um... Dave Wetzel, he's known as Dino Dave because he's always into discovering dinosaurs, and um, it's just really fascinating. But, but also, he's an apologist for creationism, and a fascinating conversation, but there's this one story that's always caught my attention, and it's called the Bronze Bell story. Well, the Bronze Bell story is about a guy in West Virginia who, when he was about 12 years old, his dad worked in a coal mine. No surprise, there's a bunch of coal caches in West Virginia. And so you not only take your shoes off when you get into West Virginia, there's a lot of coal mines in West Virginia. So he was bringing in some coal one night, and he was supposed to put it on the fire in the stove or something. And he dropped this big piece of coal that looked like just one solid piece of coal. When it hit the ground, he saw something shiny in it. He decided, I'm not going to deal with it tonight. I'm going to look at it tomorrow morning. And so tomorrow morning, he, the, he took a hammer of some sort, and he chopped away inside of this piece of coal... Um, was a bell, a bronze bell. Still had the clapper in it and everything, and at the top, it looks like a little idol. Now, let's go back to what all evolutionists believe, naturalists, Darwinists, believe about coal. What do they believe about coal? How old do they think coal caches are? Yeah, millions, billions of years, okay? So these are, these are, these are prehistoric, all these plant, animal life, prehistoric, before man evolved, so there's no possibility for any humans to be in that strata or in that coal cache. So if this bell is legit, you see the problem we have, or at least the creation affirmation that we have. Okay, so if that coal cache is prehistoric, billions of years, 
how would we have a bronze bell that was obviously not made by animals, made by humans, stuck in this coal cache? Well, they actually got the, so our friend, my friend Dave um, heard about this and he'd been asking around. He actually, this was prior to cell phones and internet. So he gets the yellow pages for West Virginia and calls every person by the last name of Anderson. I think his first name was Lewis and trying to find this guy, couldn't find him. And he's speaking at a church, I think in Virginia, and he mentions this, and the guy says, oh yeah, I know him. He was in my church, and he's an older man now, and he lives in Greenville, South Carolina. And so my friend contacted him, and he said, do you have the bell? I said, yep. He said, can I see it? Yep. So, so he goes and visits with him, brings the bell out, and, and evidently he'd had it at his home for years, and had some museum, I think even Ripley's Believe It or Not, or somebody, um, or Guinness Book of World Records, somebody wanted to buy it. And he wouldn't sell it because he was like, I don't want this to get into a museum and it not be valued for what I believe it really proves. Um, so anyway, my friend was able to convince him that his Genesis Park, they would be able to keep this as, as memorabilia and that they would use it properly, so he sold it to him. But before he sold it to him, they had it tested and they found out that it had bronze and some type of, uh, what was the other metal? Iron. And you go back to the, the genealogy of Cain, and what is it described about Tubal Cain? He was, he was gifted in metallurgy, and he was doing what types of metal? Bronze and iron. Okay, it's right there in the text. So, then he had the guy, he said, would you please submit to a lie detector test? He said, the only reason, I believe you, but I, I just want to have that. I know some people wouldn't still believe it, but I'd like to have this authenticity that you submitted yourself, that this story's true. I didn't just make it up, that I actually found this bell in the coal. And he did. He passed it. So anyway, just think about the possibilities of this. And I went online myself before our interview just to kind of see what the people who were going to attack this find were saying. And the best argument I got was, no one trusts lie detector tests anyway because they don't allow them in court. I say, so, so you're not talking about this bell found in coal. You're going to talk about, well, lie detector tests. They can't be trusted. Okay, that's ad hominem, I guess. But anyway, what does it point to? Again, we don't find our confidence in findings like this, but it is neat to see the Scripture's narrative being confirmed by these kinds of findings Think about it. This would indicate it was probably a bell made by someone who perished in the, in the flood. So what we have here is at the top of it, there's like an idol that's, that's chiseled out. You can see it online. It's called the bronze bell. And it's chiseled online, and uh, a chisel on the top into an idol. The picture's online. And... and what do we know about the pre-flood world? It was filled with violence, idolatry, immorality, and wickedness. All of this was happening. So all that to say, there are findings like the carbon dating, findings like the bronze bell, that all seem to say this goes against this uniformitarianism that you're talking about. Humans were actually alive. And the reason why that big cache of coal is on every continent is because there was something called a global flood. And all of this death was, was put into big pockets. And that's why we have fossil fuels and so on and so forth. Finally, the, <laughs> I, I, I can't believe I put mood here. It, it should say moon. All right. So if you were wondering, wow, how do our moods confirm creationism? Moon, moon, moon. Not mood. This is not a mood ring. It, um, it, it's moon receding from the sun, or from the earth, I'm sorry. Receding from the earth. Uh, another ad absurdum that can happen when you talk about uniformitarianism is all scientists right now will tell you that the moon is slowly receding from the earth. Now, if we were even go to 1.4 billion years ago, so let's just say they say it's 14.4 three or five, but let's just say we went 1.4 billion and, and use the uniformitarianism principle, back it up, the moon, all scientists will agree, it's receding, it's, it's moving away from the earth, right? Is everybody with me? 
So let's just back that up. 1.4 billion years, you know where the moon is? It's on the earth. <laughs> okay, so, so we want to use your principle for this argument, uniformitarianism. I don't agree with it, but I'm going to use it for this argument. If we were to just backtrack that, the moon is on the earth, okay? Just at 1.4. What would it be at 14.5? <laughs> be inside of it? Um, so these things are conversation pieces that hopefully we don't become sarcastic like I am right now, but, but you can engage someone to say, okay, I want to take your principle and show you that how is this a better alternative than God spoke it into existence? Yours goes into a logical absurdum. Ours goes into, there was only one eyewitness, and he was the creator, and we're going to trust him. Now, I, I want to share these with you real quickly. If you look on the back of your handout, these are five different approaches, and I wish I could say by unbelievers, but they're not. These are five alternatives that Christians are coming up with instead of believing that Genesis 1 and 2 are historical. And it runs into a real problem with the creation of Adam and Eve, that they were literal persons. And so that's where I want us to go in these few minutes that we have left. Here is what you're going to find. If you were to go on websites like Biologos that I've mentioned before, and again, I'm not encouraging you to go there, you will find that they give these five alternatives. Um, uh, preachers, teachers that I respect and like, um, like Tim Keller, is one of the ones that unfortunately has bought into some of these um, theories. He's not a full-blown theistic evolutionist, but he's close. He tries to protect a literal Adam and Eve, and the way he does that is by one of these adoptionism positions. Let me just give them to you briefly. Genesis 1 and 2, I've already mentioned this, are mythology. The creation narrative is borrowed from ancient Near Eastern mythology. You can see these. I mean, I, I watched a video just recently from a guy who says, I believe the Bible's the word of God, so he starts there, but I'm also an evolutionist. Now, he doesn't see those as contradictory. So then he goes on to say, you can see pictures of, of ancient Near Eastern art where they have this water above the earth, like a shield, like the firmament, and they got boats up there. And it's obvious what happened here. These people were uneducated. So they just took some traditions that they'd heard about, and it became the scriptures. And we've got Christians saying that, okay? Um, believers that are saying Genesis 1 and 2 are mythology. Number two, Genesis 1 and 2 are poetry. I've already mentioned this to you, that Hebrew poetry, and were never intended to be understood as history. And we just have misinterpreted the genre of scripture. Uh, just as a reminder, what vocation did these people previously have before they got the written word, the first five books of the Bible? They were slaves. So it's, it's, it's insulting to God's glory and his ability to communicate to say that God hid something into the poetry of the genre and he played a trick somewhat on these uneducated Hebrews that he just rescued from Egypt and they were just real simpletons and they misunderstood. He wasn't giving them history. It was a poem. Um, three, Genesis 1 and 2, this is what I mentioned to you at the beginning today, are compression. Genesis 1 and 2 are compressed literary depiction of a long historical process. So what they'll do is say Genesis 1 is not history, it was a poem. Genesis 2 is actually how it happened, but that allows us for long periods of time. It gets a little worse. Genesis 1 and 2 are ancient adoptionism. God entered a relationship with a pair of ancient historical representatives of humanity, homonyms. They were prior, almost humans, to Adam and Eve. About 200,000 years ago in Africa, Genesis retells a historical event using cultural terms that the Hebrews in the ancient Near East could understand. And then there's recent adoptionism. In other version, Adam and Eve are recent historical persons living perhaps 6,000 years ago in ancient Near East rather than Africa. By this time, Homo sapiens had already dispersed throughout the earth. God then revealed himself specifically to a pair of farmers who we now know as Adam and Eve. So what he's saying is evolution took place, and then at certain points, one of them's ancient, one of them's near, he just adopted a couple, called them Adam and Eve, said, I'm going to place my image on you. Now, stop there a second. What does that mean for the other humans that are still alive, according to this evolutionary theory? Remember, evolution doesn't have just one like everybody ended up with one man. 
I mean, you have some bacteria that successfully made it to a human, Homo sapien. You have some bacteria that stayed bacteria. So you got, you got humans kind of popping up all over the planet over biological evolution. So if adoptionism is right, and this is where I'm going with this, what does that say? That there were certain humans that weren't what? Adopted. So if he adopted Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago, they were given the image of God, but what about all the other hom hominids that were on the planet? They were not given the what? And, and this is particularly clear. You want to see the racism, and I've mentioned this before, of, of Charles Darwin. He was a racist of the worst sort. I'm trudging through his origin of species and his descent of man. And you don't see his racism as much till you read Descent of Man. It's horrible. And I think I mentioned last week, he, he begins to describe that there's certain, certain, because of survival of the fittest, there's certain Homo sapiens that, that, that got developed to a better level than others. And he places on a chart, he's got a picture of, and you know who's on the lowest? Aboriginals from Australia. I've been to the outback. I've met aboriginals. But, but he said they were the most ape-like. So you want to talk about racism. Evolutionary theory. I'm not saying those that believe in evolutionists are all racist. Please don't understand that. But I'm, I'm saying to you the logical outcome of there are certain races that are more fit than others. And there are certain that are more capable than others leads to flat-out racism. And that's exactly what you find in the descent of man. So this actually is a Christian version. I have a hard time calling it Christian. A Christian version of racism. So basically you have some people that are created in the image of God and some that aren't. So instead of us having a worldview that says, no, the reason why I don't treat anybody any differently based on their color, their ethnicity, is because we've all received and were created in the image of God. Right? That should end racism for us. And if we're still struggling with it, we ought to say, and Christ died for us. And there's equality at the cross. All right? So, but here is this liberal thought that ironically runs into a cul-de-sac, a dead end when it comes to, to um, racism. Now, what if we lost if we deny the historicity of Adam and Eve? And this is a big thing. If you go on Biologos, and I keep mentioning it and kind of hoping you don't, but if you go there, it's kind of become the hub for Christians who want an alternative to believing Genesis 1 and 2 are actual history, historical narrative. Um, what happens there is they begin to say, hey, we can pull back from believing that Adam and Eve were literal historical persons, and we don't lose everything. We can still just preach the resurrection of Christ. Well... That's a challenge, and I want to give you the reasons why it's a challenge. The first reason is there's going to be a loss. There's going to be a, a series of losses that take place. The first one is biblical loss. We've spent a lot of time on this, so I'm going to get this quickly. If there's no Adam and Eve, they're not real historical people, then the scriptures were not giving us the honest truth. Jesus reminds us, even in the passage I just referred to, that Adam and Eve were real people that really got married, and they're a pattern for marriage for the rest of the time. If they weren't real people, Jesus was confused. That has big ramifications, right? Not only was Jesus confused, all the apostles were confused. And the prophets were confused because they all referred to Adam as a real person. So there's biblical loss. I can no longer say this is the word of God. It's true without error. If I say Adam and Eve were not real historical persons. Secondly, there's theological loss. Now I have a real problem with describing the doctrine of man, for instance, or the doctrine of sin, because if there wasn't a literal Adam who literally fell, who literally sinned against God and bring, brought death as a consequence to all humans, I have no theological basis for anything I preach or teach. Because all of it's grounded as you go into Romans 5, and that brings us to the third one, Gospel loss. So you've got biblical loss, you've got theological loss, you've got gospel loss. If there was no literal Adam, then there was no literal fall. If there was no literal fall, then there was no literal consequence of death. And if evolution's true, there's been millions and millions of years of death prior to the what? The fall. So, Adam, you eat that fruit, you're going to die. 
what's the big deal? We've been having billions of years of death prior to this. So it's, it's like a big thing of Jenga. It's like a big thing of a house of cards. It all collapses when you say there's no literal Adam and Eve. The Bible is, is not clear about that. Fourth, there is a ethical loss. We've already talked about this. Um, if there was an adoptionism, that means that all humans in this room right now, I could not confidently say we're made in the image of God. So I don't know if I need to treat you like an image bearer. I gotta figure out, did you come from the adopted Adam and Eve or did you come from a different line? I mean, the, the whole ethic that we have as Christians of treating people uh, with value because they have been made in the image and they receive dignity because they've been made in the image of God falls apart. Finally, I, I wanna share this from my heart. There's pastoral loss. There's pastoral loss. How do I help someone who just lost a baby or a child if I can't say, you know what, this is a sin-cursed world. And praise God, Jesus Christ has dealt with death, and he is going to consume the age, and he's going to make all things right. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth. How do you deal with someone who's dying with cancer? How do you deal with someone who has um, lost everything financially? If there is no hope in the gospel that there was a literal Adam and Eve who sinned and brought the curse, because right now, if God's all powerful and God's all good, why is this world so mucked up? And if Adam and Eve weren't real historical people, there's no explanation, no pastoral guidance or counsel that I can give someone to explain to them the big storyline of scripture. This is why the world is so broken. We'll end there and we'll pick back up and we'll start next week with some questions. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for creating Adam and Eve, our first parents, and giving us life and all of us being made in your image. We praise you, God, for redeeming us through your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.